this, you know, this is, is an example of, of this unrealistic environmental testing kind of slapping people in the face and leading to an embarrassing situation with a customer. And I want to point out here, because a lot of people forget this, if your systems deal with a large data set, the, remember that the data is part of the environment effectively. And so don't test in a realistic environment, but with small databases if your actual application is going to have potentially millions of um, records in, in the databases and you only have a few thousand in your test environment. Because again, that will be a, a way in which you'll be confronted later with unforeseen production failures and people will be saying, well, why didn't you test that? Oh, I did test that. Well, yeah, you did test it, but not, not with data that was realistic. So and as a counterexample to that, here's a successful story. Um, we're testing a banking application uh, recently and built a test environment that mimicked the production environment. And the differences were limited to um, a couple areas of, uh, where the bandwidth was not as big as the production environment. But we had uh, carefully looked at um, both through testing and modeling, whether those differences would affect the results. And we were convinced that those, those differences were not in, in areas of the system that would actually be, would, would be becoming uh, bottlenecks. So we, we were fairly confident that there were a number of, of constraints that we would run into first. So to, to the extent that there are going to be any differences between your actual production environments and your test environments, Make sure that you under, you analyze those and understand them. And they, you can deal with them if there's a limited number. But uh, e each one of them adds the risk that you're going to end up missing something. This slide shows you that environment and the uh, banking system. And you can see, um, you can see here we're talking about um, the difference the difference in the between the systems and, and the production and the test environment and being pretty well well understood as to what the implications of that was and, and you know we did not anticipate that that was going to to uh, create unrealistic results just because we had a faster connection here than was going to be the, in the real uh, case so we set up the environment we ran we ran loads um, into the system um, from from the call center coming coming in through the the call center um, into the to the system there, and we ran the test in steps. So each step added under 20 users, and and what you're looking for is what's sometimes called the knee in the curve or the hockey stick. And if you've not heard that phrase before, I will show you a little bit later what what that looks like. That's basically the place where you hit the nonlinearity in performance degradation, and the system really uh, uh, really goes downhill fast. Okay, so lesson two: real-world loads. So, yep, you got to have a performance test environment, load test environment, real reliability test environment that looks like production, uh, maybe with some minor differences. Uh, you got to have data in there that's realistic, but then you have to um, test with realistic transactions and loads. If, if what's happening to the system under test does not look like what's going to happen to the production servers, and I say what's happening, I'm talking about incoming events, incoming load mixes, then your results will be misleading. So obviously think about the, the normal everyday usage. I right? get so many users of this type and so many users of that type and so many users doing this and so many users doing that. You know, you want to think about the, the what the mix of users is. Uh, but also think about things that can happen. Like if at every every night at 2 a.m. or every morning at 2 a.m. A, a, back, a backup kicks off on a server, you know, that's that's something that needs to be simulated. Uh, seasonal type of events uh, for those companies that are in, say, e-commerce or something, you'd expect that your your December would be very different than your January. Um, if you're in financial business, then you know there's there's quarterly ending periods and uh, yearly ending periods, and that those are going to be different from a load point of view. 
And of course, you want to you want to plan for the future. So if if you're experiencing growth in your company, then you don't want to just test for the level of load you've got today. You want to look down the uh, down into the future to look at the technology roadmap. Say, when do we think we're going to upgrade our technology? And that's going to tell you how long that your current uh, systems need to scale and, and give you some target for what the load test ought to go to. Another thing I think is very useful here is, yeah, real-world loads, but also go beyond the real-world loads. So, so once you've established that you can test like the real world, start cranking it up and see what happens as the system starts to fail. And is, is the, are the results acceptable or, or unacceptable? OK, so example of unrepresentative loads, under underloading during performance and uh, reliability load testing and paying the price. So we were working on a project that involved a network of interactive voice response servers tied to a call center. And it's a fairly complex collection of, of, of technology there. And then the key piece was the the interactive voice response or IVR server, uh, because if this thing wouldn't scale up to handle a lot of simultaneous customers, and I mean a lot, um, then the business case was going to collapse, the business case for the project. So the developers were creating a software that would run on the performance, uh, or on the telephony cards, and um, they they said, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll do the performance testing of that. They said. And then I started poking around into what they were doing, myself and a couple of my associates on the project. And we find out that basically they're taking half of the, t these telephony cards, and each of the telephony cards had four ports. And they're putting loopback cables into the in the half of these cards and plugging them into the other half of the cards. And they're running a load generator on the first half and the software under test on the second half. And I said, this is not a recipe for success here, guys, because you're, the load that's imposed on the, the um, server overall by this 50% telephony uh, software and 50% load generator does not look anything near like what the, the real world is, it's much less because these load generators are just lightweight machines for spewing out streams of, of dial tone sounds, uh, DTMFs are called. That's not, that's not representative of, of the real world level of load. And we got poo-pooed by the developers. Oh, yeah, we, we work on a lot of telephony systems. We know about this stuff. You know, everything's going to be fine. And you know, look at all the tests are passing. and. Uh, and I say, well, look, I mean, how, how many performance load and reliability tests have you done? Oh, well, you know, we, don't, you know, we understand the technology, and that's what's really important. Now, th th there's a passing lesson here I'll point out, a uh, corollary, if you will. It, performance load and reliability testing are, are very specialized and complex tasks. something something it's fine to learn lessons but you want to learn them in safe ways and uh, what we what we had going on on this project was what I would call careless on the job training basically that people were being assigned to do this and no uh, there's no reason to expect that they were going to be able to do this